Good afternoon. Um, I put the streaming on um, two minutes uh, prior to um, actual lecture time, so just to make sure that you guys can all settle down before we get started today. <clears throat> so this is it. So this is our last lecture. And Honestly, I feel a little bit bad about the, the fact that we cannot have the last lecture in the lecture room because it would be nice to have a, you know, share some feelings like how was that course and and how did you like my teaching because uh, uh, we've been staying together already, you know, since the uh, beginning of September. So there's um, a lot of things that we have shared. So. It would be nice to have a little bit unofficial discussion, but uh, obviously, due to these um, virus arrangements, we cannot do it today. Anyways, um, now it seems to be actually 2.15, so I guess that uh, soon we ready to go. Um, so what will happen in today's uh, lecture is that I will get started by explaining a little bit about the practical matters. Honestly, some of the details related to practical matters are a little bit unclear. Um, I'm going to organize an exam using a Moodle, but I'm not planning to use a question bank, like was the case in um, simulation of a mechatronic machine. But instead, I'm going to simply select the, the questions that uh, will be same for each one of you. And also, I'm not going to use an automatic grading system, uh, so I will uh, check all the questions by myself. But let's first discuss about the exams, and exam days particularly, because exam days is something that you need to be very much aware of. And then what follows is a recap. It's just a summary. Uh, what is that I'm expecting you to know in a written exam? And then... Um, as I promised, I will give you a few slides about the career counseling. Of course, the career perspectives are, or maybe a little different now than it was, uh, say, a month ago. But still, some thoughts that is good to take into account when selecting um, um, how to do your master thesis and what is important in my mind and what is a little less important. And this is a discussion that I, I'm a little bit feeling sad that we have at this this late because you know we've been every now and then we've been arguing like it doesn't really matter how well you're scoring from an individual course and I've been keep on saying that you know the number doesn't really matter so much and you guys are always very you know asking like why why the number doesn't really matter so much so today I want to give you a little bit of explanation in that regard and that's in a section that is career counseling now those of you that really don't care about the career counseling, it will be completely all right to leave the streaming uh, once we complete the summary part. But uh, those of you that are interested, please uh, stay online and follow my discussion. Okay, so I don't see how many online participants we have, but uh, let's move on. So let's look at my proposal regarding my proposal recording the exam days. So this is how it goes. So this is how I'm planning to do it. So I'm planning that the second midterm exam will be organized in 22nd of April. And the exam will be open for two hours only. Uh, so it resembles the conventional paper exam, except that of course it will be carried out using the Moodle database. So it goes in such a way that you lock into your model system around the time that the exam will get started. And then uh, as soon as it's going to be um, 4.15, then the exam will be open. And it will be just questions. And the questions will be the ones that I will show you later today. But I can tell you already this time. So that if you lock into your model database today, you will see that there are lecture material from lectures 8 all the way to lecture 13 which is today's lecture and then right after that there is a 
a list of questions, list of possible questions. So it's exactly the same way that we organize the first midterm exam. So again, there is a list of questions. So I'm, I'm, I am only allowed to ask those questions that are in your knowledge already when you log into Moodle database. Now we are not going to organize this voting action this time, meaning that you can, you will have a power to take one question off, and you will have a power to select one question that will be for sure in an exam paper. I'm not allowing you to do it this time because, you know, this is simply this uh, online organization. But anyways, so the questions that I can answer is available already in a model database. And again, the rules are such that only those questions I will ask. Now, once you log into model database, you will realize that there are questions from each one of the visiting lectures and each one of the topics we discussed. And uh, again, these questions are, I mean, not questions, but the subject matters are rated and the subject matters are rated and the rating you will see in my next slide. And just uh, this is for your uh, time management. So if you don't have enough time, I mean, that much of a time to invest in this exam, you can just select the, the topics that are rated as a, you know, four stars, three, three stars, and so on. Unless I leave those with our, which are rated like two stars with a little less attention. So that's how is the first, excuse me, second midterm exam. Now, <clears throat> then uh, you need to give me a little bit of time to to check how is that you performing from the mid second midterm exam and um, I will try to do this correction within a week and I'm I really want to make my best effort to give you results uh, such that from week from that exam you can see the results from model database then there's a full exam in uh, May 6th and you can also participate the full exam and you can even participate the full exam even though that you have decided to participate the midterm exams now the difference in a full exam and midterm exam is the fact that full exam covers all material from this course all material from the lecture number one all the way to lecture number 13 and I actually think that there is a total of 14 lectures because uh, the bicycle lecture is not rated as a number, but it was just called as a bicycle lecture. Now, how to prepare yourself the full exam? Well, it goes in such a way that you check the questions that were listed in a case of first midterm exam, and you will check the questions that are listed for second midterm exam, and you familiarize yourself to all those subject matters, and then you're ready to go. Again, they will be organized in a model at that particular time. So it's going to be, again, 4.15 to 6.15. And it's just questions. And you're answering those questions. And once you're done, then you just submit it and that's it. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you can wait to get the results from midterm exams. And then you can make your decision whether or not you want to participate the full exam. So this is even these mechanisms allow you even to, you know, to play safe in a certain extent. I mean that you can, of course, it's recommended to do the midterm exams. But if you're not comfortable with your grades from midterm exams, then you can also have a plan B, and the plan B is to participate the full exam in May sixth, on May sixth. All right. Too bad that we don't. I mean, I unable to ask like how you feel about this. If there is any improvement proposals, if you're comfortable with times, I simply cannot do it because um, obviously we have no good means to to communicate this time. Anyways, what are the topics? So here is the topics with the corresponding gradings. So uh, we have a total of four. Excuse me, three visiting lectures. So we actually have. A total of four visiting lectures, but the, the first one that was uh, uh, related to bicycle dynamics was already covered in the first midterm exam. So again, this is uh, topics that you need to you need to learn and you need to master 
when you are entering the second midterm exam. Again, the full, full exam covers material from the beginning to, to this lecture. Now, visiting lectures that are for the next midterm exam are biomechanics, finite time method, and PLM systems. Soon we're going to take a look at the summary from each one of these visiting lectures. But really the way to prepare yourself to these uh, subject matters is that you look at the, the recordings again. And by the way, uh, I just organized our YouTube channel. And the best way to look at these uh, videos is to, to make a um, playlist available. So check the play playlist. And the playlists are named such the way that there is a lecture number 8, lecture number 9, lecture number 10, and so on and so forth. So please click these uh, playlists and follow visiting lectures and then the other, dis other um, matters we discussed. Now other matters that we discussed, they are right after that dot line here, dust line. Now we discuss about the dress analysis in multi-body system dynamics. Shortly we discuss about how is a relation between the multi-body system dynamics and fatigue analysis and uh, contact modeling and then large deformation analysis. That was the final thing we discussed and that was um, last week. Now when look at the ratings, it's clear that I'm valuing these visiting lectures. So please take a look at the visiting lectures one more time and make sure that you have a good general knowledge about the area and particularly check the exams to make sure that you're covering, you're mastering all the exams. And then uh, then when you're moving on to topics that I'm ex I explained to you, the most valuable one is the contact modeling. So this is where I'm recommending you to get started. And once you're done with that, my recommendation is that you move on to stress analysis and then the large deformation and the finally the last one is uh, fatigue. So these are equally rated so it doesn't really matter what is an order of uh, your studies but these are the lowest importance because they're rated as a uh, two stars. So that's um, those are the topics. Again let me show how the Moodle page look like Moodle page look like because uh, what is important in a Moodle is of course how the questions are. Hold on, I need to make a few clicks here. So, all right, this uh, how it appears is of course looking very different to me than it looking for you. But all these uh, lecture PowerPoint presentations are available there, and then when you look at the the week which is this week, uh, there is a list of uh, questions. And here it is. Of course, you don't need to uh, you know, pay attention to these questions this time because, you, of course, you will have a plenty of time to prepare yourself to, to exams. So here are the questions related to biomechanics. There are four questions that are related to finite element modeling, two questions related to PLM systems, Oh, look at that. So there is a one, uh, obviously, contact modeling that the one question is missing. I don't know what it is that. Um, oh, yeah, I know what, what is this a missing question. I need to re revisit in this page because it was, a, it was related to um, bounding box method. Anyway, so I need to, to, to fix that. And then uh, stress evaluation, lot deformation. So those are the things that I can ask. Uh, Alright, so that's about it. Now, short summary about each one of the, the visiting lectures. Um, uh, if something to memorize from the biomechanics, the biomechanics, you know, is, is, it can be considered as a multi-body system. It can be considered as a multi-body system in a way that, uh, you know, there is a skeleton structure which is uh, which can be rigid or it can be flexible, and it's the same as uh, you know bodies in a multi-body system. Then there are joints that are combining bodies together, 
and joints are you know the joints that you can find in a, any biomechanical systems and then the muscles are can be considered as an actuators and then there's a bunch of external forces that could be due to the contacts or due, due to the other external forces so biomechanical systems resembles the mechanical systems heavily only big difference in the biomechanical systems is that uh, in order to actuate, in order to move, or in order to make a biomechanical model to move from one place to another, or, or make it doing something, it's usually based on the motion capture. So it's it needs um, some kind of information about what is a motion that the model should carry out. And now the motion data is then used to teach the muscle to replicate the motion. So this is how it usually goes. Machines itself can be operated by simple means. You can figure it out the input and output sing input signals, and output comes due to the, the simulation itself. But the biomechanical systems are so complicated that this not really work out. So you need to use an alternative technique. An alternative technique is to use a motion capture. A motion capture tells you, you know, how the ma how the biomechanical system should move. Final tellment. In a final tellment topic, there is a, a lot of um, a lot of videos, a lot of uh, subtopics that were discussed. But really, kind of the thing that um, I would like to highlight from the final tellment modeling is um, uh, co-simulation procedure, meaning that uh, what fi current final tellment software is are capable to do is that they can be used as a platform to couple dif different engineering disciplines together. And those can be really wide variety of things that can be combined together. They could be fluid structures, of course, you know, this is what we learn by ourselves. Electronics, optics, many different things can be packed to one big model and this is where you can see how these different disciplines are interacting with each other. Uh, again, Highly recommended to, to follow the recording from the beginning to end to see how things moving on. Now the product life cycle management PLM systems that was um that was a uh, um, quite uh, off on the technical topics we've been discussed in other lectures in this course. Um, of course, there was a, I was thinking like, what is the best way to summarize that visiting lecture? Mm, really not, still not sure what is the best way to do it. There were so many different um, figures and so many different explanations that uh, um, that really takes a while to adapt all that information. But somehow, these ideas that were related to trends and big pictures, I would like to emphasize those. So my recommendation, what comes to how to prepare yourself to exam, take a look at the video from beginning to end, and look at these big pictures and think in your head what that could mean. So you can so you can make some dreaming when you're thinking about well, how about this technology? What is that it enables? And this is this is where you can use your engineering common sense as well. All right, then words about the matters that I explained to you so the first thing is uh, was a stress analysis and this of course is needed if you wanted to uh, find it out how are the strains and stresses that are uh, applying in a structure now like we discussed earlier there are two alternative ways to carry that out uh, first way is something that is having the very nice and very fancy name and that name is uh, linear theory of elastodynamics. It simply means that the forces that are applying in multi-body simulation dynamics will be moved back to finite element software, and these forces will be used in order to compute the deformation in any time step that is simulated in multi-body system dynamics. And that gives you ability to predict. Well, first of all get uh, information about the nodal displacement and once you know the nodal displacement then you can get um, 
strains and then you can also evaluate the stresses. So that's one way to do it. Alternative way that we shortly discuss is that you can use something that is called model stress matrix. A model stress matrix is very sophisticated, very convenient, very efficient approach to get the stresses. And it's based on the fact that whatever we are simulating flexible bodies or fle using flexible multi-body dynamics, what we're actually doing is that we are solving the deformations in any given time in the dynamic analysis. We will get the information about how is a deformation. Now that information then can be then used in order to go back all the way to stresses and how it goes. It goes in such the way that in multi-body system dynamics we are solving the model coordinates, model, how the entire structure deforms. And now using these assumed deformation modes, we can back up all the way to nodal displacement. So once we get the model coordinates into our account, then we can go all the way back to nodal coordinates. That allows us to see how is a deformation associated to each one of the elements in the structure. And using the kinematic matrix, which is the matrix called B here, we can get the strains. And using elast matrix of elastic coefficients, we can get the stresses. And all these information, all these steps can be backed and they can be completed simultaneously. And this is where you can complete it simultaneously. And what is that you can do with this information? You can travel from model coordinates to stresses. This one here is called, uh, is called model stress matrix, the combination of three matrices. And this allows you to do it. Very nice, very sophisticated. Only problem is that uh, this is a little bit of software dependent approach. Sometimes commercial softwares are offering that option to users, sometimes they don't. And if they don't, it's uh, quite painful to, to do that manually because information needed is um, very in house information from final element code and uh, finite element software companies may not be willing to release that information to outsiders. All right, multi-body system dynamics in fatigue. So a um, few things that is good to remember from that. You know, the fatigue is all about, always all about how is a, a damage caused by different delta of uh, stresses, different ranges of stresses. and. Uh, Typical work cycle is something that there is a many kind of uh, stress cycles that will be closed. And this is something that is called as a stress history. The stress history could be the one that is shown in this picture here. And this could be a representation of uh, one work cycle or it could be a representation of one hour or whatever you want. This later will be a unit how the fatigue life will be measured. So it's going to be statistical uh, quantity that tells you with this and this certainty fatigue life will be this and this many work cycles or this and this many hours. Now what you need to do with this stress history is that you need to figure it out what are the stress deltas. The, del you know, the stress deltas are missing in this figure but you can figure it out by using a concept that is called rainflow analysis and as tunnel implies this is a method that you consider the stress history to be a container, water container. Uh, what you're going to do with this um, container is that you, you will fill up the container by water. And then you start looking at, you know, how is it the water get off from the container by, you know, releasing taps or making trillings to different part and parts of the container. And this tells you what are the deltas. Once you get this deltas, then you can finally evaluate what is an equal in stress loading. So what is the stress loading that is equal in terms of damage that represent find this one reference unit, which is you know one work cycle, one hour, whatever you want. And then you're ready to move on to fatigue analysis. Fatigue analysis can be carried out in number of level of details. Typically, in a, in a multi-body simulation, we limit it to using these very rough methods 
a very rough method that is based on pre-calculated tables and that's typically enough but if you want to use more sophisticated methods then you can get that you need to get additional parameters that you can get those from literature detailed financial and boundary element analysis measurements perhaps and then you can even use fracture mechanics contact modeling contact modeling uh, consists of two steps. The first step is that you need to make a prediction about the possible contacts. And that you can carry out by using a bounding box method. Once you know if whether or not there is a contact, and if there is a contact, then you move on to actual contact event modeling. And we discuss about two different ways to describe the contact itself. And we discuss that it's possible to do that using a penalty forces or alternatively that can be carried out by using a complementary approach. Now look at the ratings here. So it's uh, four stars. So again really if you're running out of time, if you're not having enough time to prepare yourself to this exam, check the content modeling lecture one more time, check the visiting lectures and leave rest with a little less attention. And of course, of course, if you're aiming to get good grade, I mean, four out of five, five out of, even five out of five, then you must check every single subject matter. Okay, contact detection based on the bounding boxes. Well, the bounding box method is consisting of several level of boxes. And really, the idea is that you put the different object inside of the boxes, and now then. Once they are inside of the boxes, then you are comparing or you're just checking if the boxes are colliding with each other. And if they're colliding with each other, then you're moving one more detail level of boxes to check if these detail level boxes can contact with each other. And if that's the case, then you're finally moving on to drawing objects to see if there is a possible penetration. Now, again, so we have root level boxes that are big boxes. An example could be a rally car that is within the big box. Entire car fits to that box. And of course, you know, the, if the car is traveling around the road, the bo boxes is following that. So that's the idea. So it's always staying within or inside of the box. Also staying inside of the box. And then you can have a, another big boxes. They could be you know, possible contact between car and say a building. A big building could be again within the very big box. Now, if this big box of car and the building are contacting, then you're moving on to next level, and the next level is branch level. And the branch level, you're already looking the different details of the car. What about tires? Are they contacting to some of the details of the building? And if that's the case then you're moving the real the drawing primitives and checking if these are contacting and if they do if there is a contact then you're moving contact event itself description that you can carry it out by using penalty forces which is based on penetration you kind of are considering the indentation of two rigid bodies and you're looking how they're penetrating and this penetration is then used in order to adjust the force that is separating these bodies away from each other. That's the very often used approach. Method is sensitive for integration settings because it's possible that the penetration becomes unnaturally high. And if that's the case, forces that are separating two bodies from each other will be unnaturally high. So it's going to be unrealistically high, and that can lead to that can lead to situations where the one body is flying unrealistically far from from another body. Um, penalty forces are typically not able to deal with the situation where there is a really high mass difference. Uh, remember, there was this example about the I think it was a military tank and the sand. That's a good example about where the mass difference is huge. You know, tank weights, I don't know, 50 tons, I guess. And then the, 
you know, one piece of sand where it's, I don't know, a crown. So there is a huge mass difference. And now because it does mass difference, this penalty force approach is in trouble because, you know, if these two big masses are colliding, and then it's possible this one sand particle is flying unrealistically far. Uh, this is um, one problem associated to penalty force method. Could complementary approach is completely different procedure. That one is based on the use of inequalities. So the, really the idea is to say, is to describe the conduct as inequality, which means that the bodies can do whatever they want, but they cannot penetrate. So it's a little bit of different concept and it, it can be used in a, in a case where there's a large number of particle type of bodies. And uh, remember we look at this um, definition of many body system, and this is where the cone complementary is used to describe the contacts between the bodies. Now, final thing, large deformation analysis, two things to remember. You know, the first thing to remember is that the trend goes towards large deformation. So this is a picture that I kind of like. So, so everything gets started from rigid multibody dynamics. And soon became clear that, okay, this is not the way to get realistic prediction from some cases. And the case is like when there is a, you know, large, you know, significant deformation, you cannot assume bodies to be rigid, but you have to take flexibility into account. Well, use a way to take flexibility into account is, is the use of floating frame reference formulas. But floating frame reference formulas and assumes that deformation is small. Strain, displacement, relationship is linear. Now, there are bodies, there are cases that this is not enough. And the case like a belt structure is a good example where structure is experiencing very large deformation. And there are cases where even this kind of uh, systems uh, need to be analyzed. And this is, you can carry it out by using a method called the absolute non accordant formulas. Then um, something that is good to remember in terms of exam is another thing. I said that there are two things to, that are good to remember. First one is this trend. Another one is that uh, there is this other trend, which is an isotermetric analysis. And the idea of isotermetric analysis is to use nerves as a foundation of finite term method. And that helps meshing a uh, problem because meshing is usually the one that takes most of the time in finite term modeling. Now, isotermetric uh, kind of built a bridge between the graphical representation of um, any systems and finite term modeling. So, that's about it. That's all the, all the topics and all the things that I'm expecting you to know once you go to um, read the exam. Again, now, just one more thing. Now, if you already log into the model database and you check the questions, you know, this contact modeling is something that I need to fix. I, I, so uh, there will be a revised version of questions available uh, let's say a little later today. It's not going to take me too long time to finish it, but don't take it right now. Don't take a look at that right now, but wait, say, um, an hour or something after I'm closing today's lecture. So then I will um, check that um, all these questions are as I'm expecting them to be. Okay. Then. A little bit about the career counseling and, uh, and now those of you that are not interested in the career counseling this is it so this was the last lecture last technical matter to discuss so um, um, so I don't know what to say other than that uh, see you around and hope to see you sometimes in whatever the university is back in business back in usual business is in a business all the time, but I'm mean back in a business in a way that we can see in the corridors. So, 
take care and um, if any questions or anything any comments or something regarding exams or other matters please send me an email now career counseling now I'm not planning to spend that many slides about the career counseling this is of course very much off from the topic of simulation this is all considered as a soft topic but um, I would still want to share some thoughts these are my thoughts these are not facts but these are my thoughts in a way that what makes sense if I uh, if I would go back in my life and if I would be around the your age what are the important decisions to make and a little bit about how I see how life goes around and when I'm saying life goes around of course I'm referring the engineering life not um, anything out from that box but a little bit about um, how I see how, uh, how the things are changing in, uh, in industrial perspectives a little bit about um, academia as well so let's take a look so I have uh, two slides about the general notes and then uh, then we're gonna move on to my um, kind of like my what I would like to propose to you what I, what I think that it makes sense you to do this time uh, now these are the general notes that are kind of like giving me a foundation to what I'm about to explain to you now <clears throat> the first thing is that you know it's important to remember that the career is an endurance sport uh, I mean of course you can have many different sport disciplines but still this is something that is not going to be a matter of a week or a month not even a year not even a 10 years but it's something that it really takes a while to build it and that's good to keep in mind so one drawback means nothing because the big picture is big picture and that is something that is good to keep in mind also sometimes what I can see is that uh, students are not giving much of it to themselves and their accomplishment now first thing to understand is that you are a student of a ranked university so LUT is uh, I'm not sure if, if you can say that the high rank but I guess it is all right to say that is a ranked university so it's you know an education that is a work level education and if you're scoring well in LUT classes I think it is important to give us a little bit of credit to yourself and understand look at me so I mean this this university that is ranked university and I'm doing fine in my classes so remember to do it and of course it's you know it's good to have you know big dreams but still this small step like say that you were able to pass my course about simulation of mechatronic machine very complicated course very theoretical subject matters and if you pass it keep some credits to yourself because that is a great accomplishment now, a little more about general notes. Now, these soft skills, which this career counseling is a part of that soft skills, they are important. They are really important. Of course, our if you look at our curriculum, we don't really much spend much time to the soft skills like intera interaction, communication skills, sto storytelling skills really we don't care about that so much but those are extremely important because you know the communication is one of the fundamental skills that helps you to proceed in your career and that doesn't really matter what is your career even if you want to live the engineering life or you want to live a mechanical engineering fine storytelling skills really makes a big difference and this is a little sad that we don't put much effort to that soft skill because if, to, if able to explain your story in a clear manner that makes a huge huge difference these marketing skills which I'm kind of referring here you know don't you know don't look them down don't make it seriously that make you make yourself to be able to adapt these skills because all skills can be adapted like you learn the mathematics so you can learn these marketing skills as well so you can learn the storytelling skills now cultural skills I mean this is what I'm kind of meaning that uh, if your desire is to stay in Finland I think that it makes sense 
not to hang around with your countrymates, but try to get involved with another international students, get involved with uh, Finnish students and so on and so forth, learn from each other. And all that is just, you know, kind of summarizing is that the broad knowledge is super, super important. The broad engineering common knowledge is something that makes a huge, huge importance. And then something that I, I am going back a little later is that, you know, in your plans, you need to look five to ten years ahead. That's something that I'm getting back a little later when I'm giving you advices regarding what is that, uh, what makes sense you to do when you're looking at your master thesis topic. Now, a little bit, kind of like saying the same thing, but a little bit of different ways is that uh, so it makes sense to work hard, of course. I'm not saying that you can do whatever you want. Of course, you need to work hard and be focused. That extremely is important. Focused and work hard, but still, even if you're focused, it's important not to get confused about details. And this is, here it is. So now I'm saying that's like a crate from a single course. And this is something that I remember, but there was a few uh, lectures some of you wanted to have a word with me when I make this statement that a grade from a single course makes no difference and you wanted to challenge me in that and you dis kind of disagree and you say that it really makes a difference it kind of make it makes a difference but really the what the people and what the people wanted to hire is an attitude there's no way that we can we can explain and teach you all the details you need when you're moving on to whatever is your career perspectives, when you're moving to industrial academia, there will be so many million new things to learn and so many new things to do. So really what the people are looking for is an attitude, which is an open mind, can do attitude. So that's why they really that one single course is not making much of a difference. The big picture makes a difference. So if your average is say, 1.1, 1.1, and then there may be a, let me see if I get the comment. Oh, no, no, not that, not that. Um, if your average is 1.1, and then there's another candidate with the average 4.1, of course, then it makes a difference. But say that, you know, if there is a average uh, 2.9, an average 3.8, making not much of a difference then people are really looking how what about the you know this attitude business you know how the attitude appears to be of course you don't know how is an attitude but how it appears to be and um, you know attitude what really matters now hey, let me give you an example you know we are hiring continuously hiring doctoral students and uh, it's difficult job to do and every now and then I'm asking um, my colleagues that what is your way to hire new students? And they're always emphasizing the attitude. And I'm uh, a bit puzzled, like why is an attitude so important? And then I, see, I have seen some cases, I have witnessed some cases that there is a, a new student, doctoral student with not so great average, but performs absolutely beautiful as a doctoral student. And then there is another in which one with a very high average and uh, the doctoral students are not so small. This is a little bit of rocky road. So what is the difference? And obviously the difference is the attitude. You know, if you kind of have this can-do attitude, I know that I'm laughing at this can-do attitude, you are laughing that too, but it makes a big difference. So you kind of are in independent and you're putting yourself, you commit yourself to this, this career that is the one that we're really looking for. Commitment. Commitment. Now, commitment, but don't to put too much to your plate. Still, this is something that you have to monitor. What I'm doing by myself, I, this is kind of like my time management plan, because it's mentioned here that, uh, you know, time management is, um, is a key for success. It helps, of course it helps, but that it helps even more than that. This is, you know, what I'm monitoring as my time management. This is my time management um, 
plan and this is what I'm monitoring. So if you have a plan, you have also need to monitor how is that you're performing or how is that you're executing the plan. And it's just telling like how is that I'm spending my time. And it's sometimes a little difficult to do the monitoring, but if you think that this is the key for success, follow it. And I recommend you to do the same. Now, finally, to my instructions to you. Soon, maybe already this time, you are moving to looking for the thesis work, the master thesis work. And now this is where this five to ten years ahead looking comes very important. Now this is, a, I know that the graphically this picture is lousy, is very unclear, but let me explain what I wanted to see here, or what I wanted to explain here. You know, the thesis work is a first kind of like crossroad. You can move to left or you can move to right. What is it you have? Excuse me, right and left. But what is it you have here in right is industry. Many of you are trimming to get the position in the industry. And yes, why not? Because it's of course clear that most of our graduates are moving to industry. Some, small fraction of all graduates will stay in academia. But this kind of reflects what are the career opportunities in academia and industry. So the industry and how they reflect uh, their career perspectives is the size of the box. Industry box is much bigger. So the opportunities are much bigger. Of course, the life in the academia is okay also. But you have to understand that if you look at the stream of people, most of the people are moving to industry. Uh, because there is so much, much more opportunities. Now, if you're trimming to get the position in the industry, now this five to ten years ahead looking, what it means? Well, it means that uh, you know, th you know that there is this um, special situation in Finnish technical universities. Uh, let me emphasize that this is only in the technical universities that people are doing their, their master thesis by getting a financial support. And yes, that is true. There are a certain amount of students that are getting financial support. But now this is something that I wanted you to think if it really is important this time to get the financial support. Or is it something that you can leave without financial support say next six months or so because the, that's how much the thesis work takes and benefit that great deal in the future. And when you look at yourself after five years, how is your position versus that uh, you're getting salary now? And this is kind of what I would like to say here is that think about the possibility that you're moving on to industry to do your thesis work, but without financial support. And why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because this will be a way to put your leg kind of inside of the, the company in a way that uh, you know they get to get to know you, they get to know your performance and then you can demonstrate the look I'm working here for free. You know that goes back to that attitude business that tells us okay look at this commitment this is a great commitment because this individual is working for free and it makes people in the industry to, to to be aware of your attitude and your performance and it makes them to be a good you know makes makes good choice for them to hire you and then you will be hired after six months when you're doing your thesis work and then after a year you will get you know already certain amount of salary after five years your salary is quite high versus the situation that you you work in some place with financial support knowing that this is just a you know not it's a fixed term contract. This is what we usually offer in, in, a, in a university. So think about this a possibility that you are not getting financial support this time, but you're benefiting that a lot in the future. And saying that, also I want to say that this is, is still part of your studies. The way you can benefit the most is that this is the way get, to get your degree and they get the new knowledge. And that's what I explained last week as well. Hmm. Yeah, then there is still a bunch of um, arrows with the different sizes. You know, this 
these arrows kind of reflect in my mind how many people moved to industry, how many people moved to academia, and this is just to do the thesis work. In academia, there is an almost equal size of arrow that moves, you know, here to academia to industry. So it's possible, very well possible, that you do your thesis in university and then you move to industry. It's difficult, more difficult that way than moving directly to industry. Then there is also possible that certain people that have, once they're finishing they they thesis industry, they're moving on to academia to do their doctoral studies. That's possible too. My last slide. You know, you know, I don't know if this is gonna help you, but of course, during and after your thesis, it's important to define your strength and emphasize your strength. Also, it's good to be aware of your weaknesses, but write them as a small font like is carried out here. And uh, don't allow your weaknesses to stop you. You can always try, at least you can try to find ways to develop yourself to convert the weaknesses to your strength. Not easy, of course not very easy. But um, it can happen, it can happen. So um, then don't not try to be perfect, at least not all the time. You know, it's important to deliver than delivering the perfect thing but late. And then realistic plan, scheduling with goals with 20% overheads. This is a, I'm sure you heard these stories before. You now the final thing is important to do it with the good supervisors, mentors, good people, career counselors. You can try to get, you know, if you get good professor in university here in LUT, if you get the good professor to supervise your thesis work, keep contact to this individual, this professor, because he or she can serve as a, your mentor, as your career counselor, and helps and give you advices. Look at this, forget about that. This is something that really pays off, really, really pays off. I don't know, okay, what else should I say? I guess there are not much else. I know that uh, Today's lecture is not a uh, two hours lecture, but I was designed to make it shorter and two hours. So uh, this is my last slide. I have no more slides to go. All right. So I guess that I want to say you again. I want to hopefully see you again in a university corridors soon, I guess. I don't know when that will be, but uh, hopefully soon. It was uh, again, um, my pleasure to teach you, it was a lot of fun, but I kind of, to be honest, I kind of missing the, the lecture because, you know, this online teaching is all right, but this interaction, missing interaction is what uh, makes this a little bit of boring, actually. So, um, all right, so take it easy and uh, see you around. This is where I'm going to close my recording and uh, and again, if any questions or comments, send me an email.